was several years ago when Pam and I were privileged to be able to lead a mission trip to Thessalonica, Greece, that uh, the city that's been inhabited for so many thousands of years, the very place where Paul was in Thessalonica, wrote two letters to the Thessalonian church there. We were ministering with a, a group of youth from our church. My computer is once again playing games with me this morning. So we were in Thessalonica, Greece, I'm trying to get back to you. We'll go with that. And uh, ministering to a group of some of the most desperate people in the world. Roma gypsies are a people who really don't have a home. They don't have a place anywhere in Europe. They've been pushed out of a lot of cities, a lot of places. And there's a whole group of these Roma people, the Tsiganis, who lived in a garbage dump outside of town near the airport. And they had taken and collected things from the actual garbage dump and had made themselves a city of sorts, had their own government, had the king of the gypsies who kind of ruled over them, and there were hundreds of them who lived there that uh, a group of her teens were ministering to for about a week or so. And just amazing ministry that took place and to see the way that folks live in different parts of the world. Pam and I also were privileged to have several adults on the trip with us who kind of took the teens at the, the last day, we got them back to the airport, we got them on a plane back to the States with the adults, and Pam and I were able to stay in Greece for another week. And being based in Thessalonica, we were able to take trips to Philippi and all around the territory, and then eventually to Athens and to Corinth, and see those cities where Paul walked. And I remember in Athens going to the ancient forum that's still there. In Greek, they called it the Agora. In Latin, they call it the Forum. And that place where Paul walked into in Athens. And it says in Acts 17 that he walked around and he saw the way that they lived. And he saw the way that they worshipped. And he saw what the Athenians were doing. He heard their philosophers. And then he spoke to them a sermon that many today still look at as one of the best examples of enculturating the gospel of taking the Word of God and putting it in a way that that culture could understand. And so we actually have today this massive field of study on Acts 17 as how do we take the Word of God and put it in a local language in a way that local people can understand. There's an entire church planning movement called Acts 17. The place where Paul spoke to some of the philosophers is called Mars Hill. And maybe you've heard of Mars Hill Church, and there's a fellowship of Mars Hill Churches. There's a variety of mission agencies in the United States who take Acts 17 as their model. The way that we're going to do ministry is an Acts 17 kind of ministry. And one of the things we've seen here even over the weeks is that Paul has this amazing way in his letters of using that local language and that local color. We went through a study in the book of Philippians, and we spent several months in Philippians seeing that Paul took the language, the history, the very culture of the people there, and he used so many specific things that they would understand, that they would know from their culture as he wrote this letter to them. We can see the same thing in his letters to the Thessalonians, his letters to the Ephesians, to the Galatians, to the Romans, to the Corinthians. He uses things out of their own culture, out of their own language, and speaks to them using things that would legitimate his message in their own understanding, in their own cultural context. We've become somewhat familiar with that, with Paul's letters, with Peter's letters, with James's letter in the New Testament. We've, we've come to understand that. But something happens when we shift to the Old Testament. Something happens in our thinking when we go to the Old Testament minor prophets, and we somehow get a different picture in our minds, don't we? Of a man, probably in a robe of some sort, or maybe dressed a little different, walking into a town and simply standing and uttering forth the very words of God as an oracle, and it's as though God himself just uses this man like some sort of an automaton, some sort of robot. That God himself just speaks words and the man is standing there almost lifeless, almost with no recognition of culture or history or his time or his people. And he just speaks what God has given him to speak and God has condemned you and you must repent or you will be destroyed by Almighty God. And unfortunately, 
sometimes in church we've, we've done a poor job when that's the only picture we've given you. And that's the only understanding some of us have of these prophets. So even when we think of Isaiah or Jeremiah, we think of someone who goes before the king or stands before the people and he just declares the word of the Lord as though it's some heavenly language that the people are just supposed to, oh, we hear the words in our language, but it's just like generic. And what I hope we're seeing in our study of the minor prophets, starting with Amos, because he seems to be the earliest of these contemporary minor prophets, is that these prophets go into this town, or they go into the region, or they're, they're, they're speaking to the people they already know. And yes, what they speak is the very word of God. Just like we would say, every word of Philippians is the very word of God, right? Would we not say that everything Paul writes in his letters that we have in Scripture, we call those the inspired words of God? But they're clearly Paul's words that God has breathed through him. But he's used Paul's own history and Paul's own understanding of culture and Paul's own wisdom and the, the local atmosphere to write these things in a very enculturated way. And we see that in the New Testament. Well, guess what? These Old Testament prophets do speak the word of God, but they don't do it in a generic white robe kind of way. They do it in a way when they speak to the people in a language that they understand. And I don't just mean Hebrew or Aramaic. He speaks to their own heart. He speaks to their own culture. And we see each one of the minor prophets doing this. And so, for those who are visiting, we've taken a, the whole summer to kind of do a, a, a quick survey of the Old Testament. It's taken months, but that's still pretty quick when you consider the thousands of years that we've covered. And so we've done all of this history and all this just to get us up to the point of the Minor Prophets. And we've landed in the book of Amos. So turn there, if you will, this morning to the book of Amos. And we're going to see in Amos that he speaks in such an amazing way that he is speaking forth the words of God, but with this local language and with this local color and in ways that they can understand. So up to this point... Well, we got half of this running. Now I just got to find what I did with my slideshow. <laughs> it's none of those. Those are the cookies from last week. <laughs> and I don't know where it went. It seems like we mirrored to something else. Well, this this is a new mystery for me, folks. I'm sorry. Give me just a moment. I'm going to try to find where that went. No, I don't know. We'll have to go without our slides to make this this morning. So I've titled this message The Final Countdown because what, what we would see on the map that's not up here this morning, we've got some nice island. I don't know what that is. It, it might be, but I don't know where it got downsized. Because it's not one of these. Amos didn't have slides. Amos didn't have slides. He spoke in a different way. I'm trying to speak in our culture in a way that we would understand, and it's not working beyond all reason this morning. So, we will go on. Amos chapter 2, we've come up to verse 6, but here's what's going on over the last period of Amos' life. He has been in the northern kingdom of Israel for a while. You see, there's, there's an indication that he's actually going to minister for a couple of years in this area. And so we don't picture Amos just, he shows up one day, he gives his spiel, takes him an hour or two, speaks forth the word of God, mic drop, goes back to Judah. That's not the idea. The image is that he's been here for a while. He's giving these prophecies from God, he's saying these things over a somewhat extended period of time, over days, weeks, even months. That's not mine. And so... By the time we get here, Amos has already spoken out, we saw this last week, seven different war oracles, these war champs, that he has called God to punishment on all of these nations that surround Israel. And he's like, for three transgressions or for four, the Philistines are going to be no more. Kind of this, you know, chanting, kind of a pep rally kind of a thing that's going on. For three transgressions and for four, God's going to smash the Assyrians into the floor. I mean, it's just it's kind of like God's going to do these things. He's called out his wrath on them. And, and the Israelites are going to be clapping. And you're going to be like, yes, yes, we agree with all of these things. 
because to this point, he's critiqued all these other unacceptable patterns of conduct. If you look at your notes, I've got that sentence there for you. Amos has critiqued all of these unacceptable patterns of conduct in the nations around them. So to this point, his audience is going to be very encouraged and not threatened by his message. They've already bought into it. In fact, the Israelites likely have internalized Amos's message and endorsed his announcements of judgment. What does it mean to internalize the message? It's a big word. I know kids, it's back to school week. You haven't started yet. Vocab hasn't kicked in. You're not quite that big. They've internalized it. They've heard this and gone, yeah, yeah, that's right. Edom really is a bad country. What they've done is just so wrong. He's right to call down judgment. The Syrians, the well, Syrians really are violent. They're horrifically violent. He's right to call down God's judgment on them. The Philistines, we all know how bad the Philistines are. They're historically just bad. He, he's right to call down God's judgment on them. And the things that Amos has pointed out, the sins he's pointed to, Israel in its own internalization, in their own history, in their own moral standards, they, Yes, that's wrong, and, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. And so seven different nations so far, Amos has called down judgment, and the Israelites are going, yes, yes, yes. We're behind you, Amos. You're going to go far. We, we support this message because they agree with it. And in their own standards of morality, and in their own worldview, they recognize all of these things are wrong, and God is right to call down punishment on them. And then he comes to the eighth war order. And by this time, he's lived among them. He, he, he's not just like appearing in town and then disappearing at the end of the day. He's spoken these words over and over. He's living somewhere in town. He's staying with somebody at an inn or a, a place with an extra room. He's eating somewhere. At least once a day. I mean, we don't get the idea that he's gone on some you know, major fast and gone over. Just think about the reality of this. He's living here. He's been in town for maybe weeks. He's eating somewhere. He's fellowshipping with people. He's from Judah. They're from Israel. But they're Jews. They still fellowship with one another. They have somewhat the same purity laws, ritual law, laws. He, you know, I kind of made the leap last week. Maybe he's going to Hezekiah's falafel tent and have the table. He's yeah. going somewhere. He's eating with somebody. He knows them. Probably some have had him over for dinner. Maybe even some of the officials like, we like this guy's message. He's not like that Elijah. He's not like that Micaiah. Those other guys. We, we like this Amos. Tell us more. And he just repeats these words of judgment against these other nations and just how bad they really are. So they bought in. They've endorsed it. They've been encouraged by it. And now Amos speaks to Israel directly, and maybe some sensed it was coming. But look at the words in Amos chapter 2, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions, or for four, they're like, ah, who's next, Amos? Israel. Israel, I will not revoke your punishment. And now here it comes. They've internalized the message. They know it matches up with their standards. He, he's already spoken their traditions in ways that the audience has recognized as part of their own social order. And now he's going to unmask the Israelite heart. Now he's going to unmask for them this discontinuity between their own authoritative traditions. The very things that their nation was built on. The very things that they hold to as the ten tribes of the north. And their very traditions now. He's going to speak to them and say, these are your traditions. These are your foundations. But let me unmask that there's a discontinuity now between your own traditions and what you actually do. How you actually live. Your actual behavior. I will not revoke their punishment. Why? What are the ways that he condemns them? Oh, is it going to be horrific violence like we've seen with Syria? Is it going to be idolatry? Is it going to be their pagan worship? Is he going to call them out for just all sorts of wickedness in high places? Is he going to call them out for radical injustice from the king himself, the Jeroboam? Is he going to call them out for child sacrifice, some horrific thing? 
Look what he points to as evidence that they are worthy of judgment before God. Because you sell the righteous for money. You sell the needy for a pair of sandals. You pant after. Oh, you pant after. When we just sang the song, as the deer pants for the water, my soul pants for you. Oh God, I long for you. He says, you know what you long for, Israelites? You know what you desire so much. You, you think of it when you're lying in bed at night. And it's on your mind when you get up and brush your teeth in the morning and you're thinking of it as you look in the mirror and you just want it. And as you talk to yourself about the day, here's what you pant after. Here's what you have your eyes set up. Here's what's in your heart. You want the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless. You want to see them suffer. You want to see them so destitute that they put on sackcloth and ashes and put the dirt over their head to show you that they are mourning their horrible, terrible, humble condition. And you long for it. You turn aside the way of the humble. The man and his father resort to the same girl in order to profane my holy name. What does that mean? The mistreatment of the slaves in your own house. The Israelite slave girls. You have sold them into slavery for their debts. You have taken them as slaves. And now you abuse them sexually and have pleasure with them. That's how greedy you've become. And this profanes my holy name. You profane the very name of God. What's it mean to profane the name of God? A slide as it was down in the chalkboard, Joe. That means you can't see it, neither can I. I don't know where it went. <laughs> Profanity, profane things, the vulgar, the crass. But more than that, in relation to God, it means you disrespect His name. You fail to give reverence to His name. You do not revere God for who He is. When you do these things, Israel, you profane the name of God. And on garments taken as pledges, you stretch out beside every altar. And in the house of your God, they drink the wine of those who've been fined. What in the world does that mean? You take their garments. You take some of their clothes as, a, as collateral because they owe you money. And we're going to start looking at here in a moment at some of the things that Scripture has to say about these very things that they're doing. But here's the picture that he gives them. Not, oh, you're horrifically violent. Oh, you're warfare. Oh, you're idolatry. Oh, you're pagans. Oh, you're child sacrifice. None of these things that he said to the other nations. He says, look at the way that you treat the poor. That's stunning to me. It's truly stunning when I reflect on this oracle and I think of all the things that he could say. And he's going to go on. I mean, if you look, it's like Amos doesn't end here. Amos has a lot more chapters, and there's several of them. We're going to spend a couple of weeks looking at this. It's like Amos, through chapter 9, when we're just in chapter 2, this isn't all he has to say to them. But this is how he begins. Why? Because he knows they can't deny it. He knows that there's no way they can get around this. They can, we, we don't do that. We don't act like that. We, they've so internalized his message already, and he's lived among them, and he's seen it. And yes, these are the very words of God, inspired and breathed by God, but Amos has seen it on the streets of the cities. And he's seen it happening all over Israel. And he can point to specific things to say, you disrespect the name of God when you say these things and act in this way and carry on like this. How? In your treatment of the poor and what you say about them. Well, they ought to get a job. They ought to stop getting off the side of the down. Just get out there and go to work. You profane the name of the Lord. Well, they just need to learn. These are the consequences. They chose not to finish high school and then they started doing drugs. This is just what happens. So they got what they deserve. You profane the name of the Lord in the way that you treat the poor. This is hard stuff. This is stunning to me. Now look what God has to say. This is what they've done. Now look at where God goes next with this. Yet it was I. It was I, the Lord, who destroyed the Amorite before them. Though his height was like the height of cedars, he was strong as the oaks. I destroyed the fruit above and his root below. I'm the one who wiped out your enemies. And the Israelites would go, 
Yeah, that's that's our tradition. That's true. We we know that's right. That's the stuff we say all the time. It was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I led you in the wilderness for 40 years that you might take possession of the land of the Amorite. Well, those are the stories we tell around the campfire every night. Those are the traditions that our people have followed for hundreds of years. We believe that it was God who brought us up out of slavery. Oh. And now we're making slaves of each other. It was God who brought us up out of that bondage. And now we're seeking to put each other in bondage over financial debts. It was I who raised up some of your sons to be prophets and some of your young men to be Nazarites, taking a vow before God. Isn't this so, O sons of Israel? Isn't this so? Isn't this what we say as a nation? Isn't this what we believe, Israelites? Isn't this our tradition? Yes, Amos, it is. We can't deny it. These are all things that we say we believe. These are all things that we say are part of our history. These are all things that we say we're going to live out. But instead, you make the Nazarenes drink wine. You command the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. Yeah, we kind of joke about Elijah and Micaiah and how we didn't like to hear what they had to say. Our kings not listening to the prophets. We, you're right. So what's coming? Verse 13. Behold, God says, I am weighed down beneath you like a wagon weighed down and filled with the harvest sheep. You're a burden to me, says the Lord. Flight will perish from the swift. The stalwart will not strengthen his power, nor the mighty man save his life. He who grasps the bow will not stand his ground. The swift of foot will not escape, nor will he who rides the horse be able to save his own life. You can run, but you can't hide. Even the bravest among the warriors will flee naked in that day. See, there's a difference between naked and naked. Like, <laughs> naked is just when you don't have any clothes on. Naked is when you don't have any clothes on, you're up no good. So I read this. <laughs> Even the bravest among the warriors will flee naked in that day. It's bad. What a crazy picture. Even your bravest warriors will be stripped down, humiliated, and running for their lives. We talk about this is a time when Israel is strong. This is a time when they're prosperous. Their military is strong. They're ex exercising some economic power over the southern kingdom of Judah. Egypt is weak right now. Assyria is not yet strong. Israel has a time of great prosperity and strength. But they've got a lot of hope in their army. These fortified cities that are all through the north as well as the south. And it's a time where they're strong. And they, they glory in these things. God says it's not going to save you. You can sing your patriotic songs. You can say our nation was founded on God and our forefathers believed in Him. You can wave your flags. Look at the way you treat the poor. Look at the way you consider those who are the most humble in your nation. The most humble among you. So what was Israel doing that was worthy of judgment? They were profaning the name of the Lord. In your notes, it said, how? How did they profane the name of the Lord? How did they disrespect? How did they show irreverence to the name of their God? We saw in these verses 6 through 8, they exploit the poor, the needy, and the struggling lower classes. This is what Amos points to. Of all the things he could have called out in the culture, he points to the treatment of the poor. Why? If you've been with us for a while, you remember early in the summer I gave out these packets to you. Kind of an Old Testament bookshelf. Some things that had some timelines in it, a way for us to look at the Old Testament, some things to go through. I don't expect that you have it with you this morning. I hope you still have it at home somewhere. One of these pages said, Major Social Concerns of the Covenant. There was a copy here for everybody. I said, you know, the prophets are going to reference these. One of the things that God 
considered incredibly important when he gave the people a covenant with him at Sinai was the exploitation of the poor, the treatment of the poor. So I've got some verses listed here that we're going to look at this morning. Exodus 22, 21 through 27. It's going to help us understand some of what we looked at already. Exodus 22, 21 through 27. You've got it written down there. You can go back there during the week, take a closer look at it. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Remember where you came from. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan, you know, the most vulnerable among you. If you afflict him at all, and if he cries out to me, I will hear his cry, and my anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with the sword. Did God make that pretty clear early on? Yeah, he did. Your wives will become widows, and your children will become fatherless. You men who do not pay attention to the poor, the needy, the widow, the orphan among you. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, don't act as a creditor to them. Don't charge them interest. Here we go. If you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you know, as a down payment, as collateral for something you've loaned him, you have to return it to him before the sun sets. For that's his only covering. It's his cloak for his body. What else will he sleep in? It will come about when he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am a gracious God. So there was this cultural thing that they did. If you, you need to borrow some money, you need to borrow some seeds for me to plant. For, well, I need some collateral. What do you have? What I have is my cloak. I sleep in it. I live in it. It's in one garment that I have. Well, give it to me as a cloud. You work the fields without it. I'm going to hold on to this until you pay me back. That's what they were doing. And God said, if you do that, give it back to him at night so he can cover himself with it. You can take it again the next morning. You can hold his collateral during the day to show that he owes you. But don't keep it from them all night. What did Amos say they were doing? They were piling up the cloaks of their creditors and reclining on them when they worshipped their gods. They were using them as couches, as cushions. Now, I've, I've, I've seen the youth in the Sunday school class, they got these beanbag chairs, right? And you kind of settle in your beanbag chair, you kind of get cozy there. Can you imagine these ears of lights? When they were going to their places of worship, like, I'm going to get myself a cushy seat on the floor. You know, the more cloaks I get, the higher I'll be. I'll be higher than the guy next to me. I'll have a bigger seat than he has. I'll be like, well, those giant beanbag chairs, and he's on a little beanbag chair. They were literally bringing these things into their worship centers before the altars and reclining on. Look at my sack of cloaks. Look what I got. Can you imagine? I, I tried to think of an illustration. What would this be like today? I, I, it would be like a, a man who owns a, a lot of properties. And he's, he's leasing the people and they haven't paid him, so he's got eviction notices. And he uses his eviction notices as little markers in his Bible. <laughs> and so in Sunday school class, he flipped to this eviction notice like, oh yeah, that guy is, you know, I am kicking him out tomorrow morning, Monday, first thing on my agenda, call the sheriff, get him out of my apartment. And then he flips over here to another eviction notice, and he flips in, and he's just using them to mark his Bible. Because he's so greedy, what he pants after is just more and more and more, and I don't care what it costs him. And I can, I, I feel the wheels spinning in my own brain. But, but at some point, we've got to talk about fairness. But at some point, we've got to talk about, but you know what? At some point, we've got to talk about the word of God, what Amos said in Amos chapter 2. And what God says is that you profane my name if you mistreat the poor of the And at some point, we need to read these verses. So Leviticus 19, 9 through 14. Leviticus 19, 9 through 14. If you own property, you've got a rich you notice, you buy it right now. I'm not calling you out. I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> 19, 14. Now, when you reap your harvest of your land, don't reap to the very corners of your field. Neither shall you gather the gleanings of your harness. You know what gleaning is? I had to look it up. Gleaning is when you gather the leftover crops from a farmer's field after the commercial harvest has taken place. So you've got the professional commercial harvest. You've got to be going through and picked everything. You're going to pick every single thing off. Some of it wasn't good enough. Some of it wasn't ripe enough. Some of it was too small. It didn't meet the corporate standards. So they've gone through the fields, and there's been the commercial harvest. But there's some still left out there. 
And God is saying, don't go back through and pick every single little thing. Why? Don't glean your vineyards when you're picking all your grapes. Don't go pick all the little green ones, get everything off the vine. And don't gather the fallen fruit from your vineyards. This stuff is a little extra ripe. Well, I'm going to pick it up anyway. Leave those for the needy and for the stranger. Why? Because I am the Lord your God. So we show that you're God in the ways that we treat the needy and the poor and the stranger. Yes. Don't steal. Don't deal falsely. Don't lie to one another. Don't swear falsely by my name as to profane the name of God. You're like, well, we don't swear his name. We don't do that. Oh, gosh. Oh, and gee, I would never do that. And so we don't do these things. Don't oppress your neighbor. Don't rob him. The wages of a hired man are not to remain with you all night long until morning. Pay people what they do. Don't curse the deaf man. Don't place a stumbling block before the blind. Revere your God. What is he saying? Care for the needy among you. Care for the disadvantaged. Be mindful of them. Meet their needs. Don't despise them. Don't slander them. Why? Right in the middle, it says, because I am the Lord your God. And what you do reflects me. And how you act is supposed to show people what I'm like and what I look like in all that you do. Leviticus 25, 35 through 43. Just a little bit further to your right. Leviticus 25, 35 to 43. Verse 35. Now, in case a countryman of yours becomes poor and his means with regard to you falter, then evict him. Kick him out on the street. No. Then sustain him like a stranger or sojourner that he may live with you. Really? But he's indebted to me. I loaned him money. He didn't pay it back. He rents a place for me. He can't pay it. He... This is how God and said they should treat one another. Don't take usurious interest from him. Don't charge interest. Revere your God. How? Let your countryman live with you. Don't give him your silver at interest or your food for gain. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and be your God. The same model that Amos is using. The same things that the Israelites have taught in their tribes for hundreds and hundreds of years. These same very words that they've already legitimated. They've already said these are kind of our, part of our founding documents. This is already part of who they are as the ten tribes of the north as the people of God. And Amos is reminding them. When he brought you up out of slavery, when he brought you up out of Egypt, you were slaves. You had nothing. You were in bondage, and I was gracious and merciful to you. Why? Because I loved you. Because I chose to do this. And when you came to that land of Canaan that I said I was going to give you, who fought the battles? We did. No. I did through you. I did that. You didn't do that. Who built those cities? We didn't. No, you didn't. Somebody else built those. I gave them to you. Who planted all those crops and vineyards? Ooh, somebody else. Yes. I brought you into cultivated fields. I brought you into cities that were already there. I defeated your enemies before you. Uh, you know what's really strange this week when I read these things? Man, I kept hearing this speech from Barack Obama that I hated at the time. You didn't do that. Somebody else did that. You didn't build that. Somebody else built that. And my political stuff gets in here and you go, I don't like that. I don't like who said it. I don't like what Amos says it either. This is tough stuff. And there are things that we say that we believe. And there are things that we say define us. And these were the things that the Israelites said defined them. But they were not hanging out of them. They were panting after putting the poor in subject to themselves. They greatly desired to abuse the needy. They were selling each other into slavery for the, for the price of a pair of sandals. Pant after seeing them helpless and turn them aside 
and then you even abuse them. You show just how far you go in this, and that you even sexually abuse them, exploit them even further. Why did they profane the name of the Lord? Was it intentional? Did they say, let's profane God's name today? Amos seems to give a different picture. In Amos 2, 10 through 12, we have these verses. I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I led you in the wilderness for 40 years. Hmm. They forgot where they came from. They forgot that they had come from slavery and bondage themselves. Verse 9, I destroyed the Amorite before you. His height was like the height of great cedars. He was strong as oaks, but I destroyed his fruit above and his root below. I wiped them out. They forgot who gave them the land that they live in. Verse 11 and 12. I raised up prophets. I had some set aside taking a Nazaritic vow so they could be set apart to the Lord. Isn't this so? And look what you did. You forced them to go against their vows, and then you commanded the prophets saying, Don't prophesy. You want to follow up on some of this during the week right now? Isaiah chapter 30, verses 9 through 11. Don't prophesy. Jeremiah 11, 21 through 23. Don't prophesy. In Stephen's speech in Acts 7, verses 51 through 53, he reminds the Jews of his day. To which of the prophets did you not say, stop prophesying in the name of the Lord? They forgot to listen to the word of the Lord. They forgot to listen to the whole counsel of the word of the Lord. In summary, they forgot that everything they selfishly enjoyed came from God alone. This is a hard one this week. Because you know it would be easy if you pointed to their false worship, if you pointed to their idolatry, and we could all say, we don't do that. We don't worship pagan gods. We don't have any idols. We don't literally bring golden calves in and worship. We don't do any of that. We don't do the stuff these Edomites did. We're not violent like that. We're not horrendous. We're not murdering. We don't mistreat the pregnant women and rip them open and battle. All these horrible things. And we don't do any of that. Where have we come from? What's our past? What's our history? Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 come to mind. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. So far, we've looked at Old Testament passages. We can say, well, we're not Israelites. We don't live in a theocracy. These things no longer apply. We're now in the New Testament covenant. There's no condemnation for us. Well, that's true in a sense. But do we represent God or do we profane his name? Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's working the sons of disobedience. Among them, too, we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulged in the desire of our flesh and mind. We were by nature children of wrath. That's the rest. And I know some of you in here, your testimony lines up pretty well with that. A lot of the rest of us, we were saved when we were kids. We grew up in Christian households. We don't know any of this. We don't know what we were saved from. We don't have this litany of stuff that we can point to. We don't have the big flashy testimony. Nobody's going to be impressed by me saying, I was mean to my brother when I was five. <laughs> I got saved when I was seven, and then my life changed. But, uh, I have this kind of testimony. You know what I can do? I can look at how stinking addicted I am to carbohydrates and other munchy, tasty things and go, what would have happened? What would have happened? That first year of college, long before I went to Bible school, let you know, those first three years of college, University of Texas, when I had a roommate, we smoked a lot of dope and kept a lot of alcohol in the apartment. And I was on a national debate circuit. We went to a lot of tournaments where you had 600 college students in one hotel. Our bathtub was the first one to get filled with ice in the hotel so we could have the parties in our room. And the alcohol and the drugs were everywhere. You know what would have happened to me had I gotten further into that? Oh, I hate to think. I hate to think where I would be, knowing how addicted I am to okay things like Cheetos, where would I be? So, so far. By the grace of God, you have been saved, verse 5. Why? Verse 4, God being rich in his mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with 
Christ. By grace, you've been saved. You've been raised up with Him and seated with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, He might show the surpassing richness of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace I've been saved through faith. Not of myself. It's the gift of God. Not as a result of my works. I have no reason to boast. And then He made me His workmanship. Creating me in Christ Jesus for good works. Be prepared before Him. That I would not profane the name of God, but walk in the name of God. And demonstrate His goodness to others. And how do I do that? In the ways that I think of the Lord. In the need among us. Not just the poor and needy out there in the world somewhere. Because you know what? It's easy to write a world, to check the world vision. And my wife and I have done that many, many, many times over the years. It's fairly easy to adopt a kid through Compassion International World Vision. When we started to have our own kids, we thought we'll provide for them. God's provided enough for us to provide for them. He's provided enough to provide for at least one other child too somewhere in the world to adopt one. And then it was two, and then it was four. And we didn't do the cards with the names in our fridge, but we gave an amount each year. We said, we're going we're to take care of a family somewhere. We can do that. But you know what? That check was pretty easy to write and send off and I never saw them and didn't have to deal with them personally. We've written checks to City Union Mission. That's pretty easy enough. It eases our conscience a little bit. I don't have to deal with it when I see the homeless in Kansas City. Let's make a contribution to City Union Mission. Love what they're doing. they got people who can figure it out. The words of God give us a different message in these passages. I'm going to ask you to read this week. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. James 2, 1 through 7, 15 through 17. What does God say about the poor and needy among us? Not just out in the streets and under the bridges of I-70, though it may include them too. What about our own body? What about here? Matthew 26 is that story of when Jesus has a woman come and anoint him with a very costly perfume. And his words have been taken by so many Christians out of context. You know what he says there? They said, that gift could have been given to the poor. And he said, oh, you'll always have the poor with you. She gave this to me right now. And you know what we've done with that? He said, see, it's just going to be an ongoing problem. We can't fix it. We can't solve it. The poor are always going to be there. I'll probably use that verse myself in that context. That's not at all what Jesus meant. He meant you can help the poor tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and you want to. I'm here right now with you, worship me, but then you go out tomorrow and you help the poor, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And you know who the guy was who said, We could have used that for the poor. That's why I got these little parentheses in John 12. That was Judas, the one who controlled the money bag. And John reminds us, because he was stealing from it. Because he was greedy like these men in Amos' day. Where we come from? Where's our adoption come from? What are those verses this week? The word of God in our life from Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. Essentially, the question is this. Do we own everything that we have? Or are we just stewards of it? How do you see yourself in all your possessions? Are you stewards taking care of the king's resources? Or are you an owner? This belongs to me. This is mine. These are hard and challenging words for Amos for us. Somehow, the way that we deal with the poor and needy in our own congregation and other congregations that we know is a reflection of whether or not we revere and respect the very name that God has called us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, but we admit sometimes it's hard. And sometimes it's challenging in a way that we don't like. And sometimes it touches on things that we'd rather not have touched. It speaks to things we'd rather not speak about. Thank you for rescuing us from bondage to sin. Thank you for releasing us from slavery to the enemy. Thank you for setting us free, for adopting us as your sons and daughters and giving us eternal life. And God, we pray that we would reflect your name 
that we would bring glory to your name. That when people speak of us and speak of our church, the name of God is praised and not profaned. And show us where we need to apply these words for Amos. Show us where we need to internalize them and understand where you may be speaking and convicting us individually and as a corporate body. Give us your wisdom, guide us as we continue this journey through the words of your prophets. Give us understanding, help us to take to heart what you've said. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.